something happened this week. I, it, 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 the hints had been there, but it didn't, hit, it didn't hit me until about Wednesday. Maybe it hit you another time, but on Wednesday, I was walking my crazy dog up above my house, as we tend to do about every morning, and there's a nice rock outcropping above the house where he can stand there and look down over the whole valley like some spastic lion or whatever he thinks he is. And he runs around and chases chipmunks. He runs into the aspen grove that's above my house. Sometimes we walk above the aspen and there's this open field that he can bounce through like a deer and you see his little tail sticking up above the grass and then he bounces and he has fun in that. And, and I enjoy walking through and smelling the, the, the pine trees and um, all these flowers, Colorado flowers. I know a bunch of them. I still have many to learn. You know, I've got aster and columbine and Indian paintbrush. There's lots more flowers up there that keep changing and those, those colors on the ground give way to these colors in the, in the canopy, these different greens and the shadows in the morning. They come through just pulsed with life. It's as though the trees are telling me, uh, the day is coming. Uh, uh, Enough of this prayer walking, enough of this coffee drinking. Go and find out what the world holds. It's like the colors just yell at you. The air has been all summer so wet and so fertile, fresh with the scent of blossoms, filled with mosquitoes, isn't all that great, filled with birds and woodpeckers. There was once a moose up there when we took our morning walk, and Chugach ran it into the pond and and just kept going around in circles to keep the moose in there. That wasn't the best uh, memory or lesson for him. But the whole area, my forest by my house, is just filled with a symphony of beauty and of wonder all summer. Wednesday, something was different. It wasn't better, it wasn't worse, it was just different. Because those flowers had all kind of wrinkled down and they cracked under your feet when you walked by. The leaves on the trees were golden. And, and, and so there's morning shadows now. There's something, just a, a dull glow, almost like it told you that there's a secret. Just sit and listen and wait and you'll learn the secret. And the air smells different. It's dry. There are no, no mosquitoes left. And fewer birds and the fragrance of something about the plant's lives is still there. It's as though all the shiny stuff, all the sweet stuff has passed on or is passing away, and in their place comes something just deep, something essential. There's, there's wick and wisdom from those plants. And the forest isn't, isn't ready for the weight and the darkness of snow to come, but it is figuring out how to maintain itself through the hot days and the cold nights. There is a plant wisdom to autumn, to fall. It's not loud, but it's effective. And sometimes people ignore these leaves as they turn brown and fall into the ground. They ignore the leaves as they go underfoot or even under the soil. Sometimes people just give up and they prepare for winter right away. Sometimes people hold on so tightly to summer and they miss this rich part of the full rhythm of life. I've been in many forests in autumn, but what do I really know about the autumn of life? Uh, the metaphor of, of uh, young folks who are in that spring and new and shooting up in the summers for, I, I'm staunchly in the summer. I mean, I, I, that's where my life is. I, I've got more bumps and bruises than people my age, and I still have one grandpa left, but I'm decades in either direction from getting a discount to go anywhere. <laughs> This is the summer of my life, so what could I possibly say to you about the autumn of life? Let's start with this. Uh, The story of Job. You know the story of Job. It's this guy who, life was going well. He had a wife. He had kids. He had a successful business. uh, He had earned his position in life. People from town would come in and consult him. His advice was respected. And then it all came crashing down, as sometimes things do. I don't know, he might have been 50 years old, and his life just started crashing and falling apart. And friends would come, and they would try to tell him platitudes of, you'll get over this, it's just, it makes you stronger. Uh, but that never worked. It just kind of made him resentful, and, and he didn't want to talk to them. Until chapter 32. Chapter 32 of Job, there's this guy named Elihu, Elihu. I don't know how to pronounce it. Let's say Elihu. And he comes and this is what he says to Job, who's just a very sad and miserable midlife crisis, maybe past that life crisis. He says, uh, Job, I, I am young and you are old. So I held back from telling you what I think. I thought those who are older should speak, for wisdom comes with age. But there is a spirit within all people. There is a breath of the Almighty within them. So please listen to me and let me know uh, what you think. 
So I don't know anything about the autumn of life, but I'm going to try to hear the breath of the Almighty, the Word of God, and try to share some good news with all of us about this part of life. Because we've been on the series, the whole holy life, birth, and how we have a purpose in our life, claimed by God at baptism. You grow through your mistakes and your mercy and God's mercy. Uh, you live as part of a community, which is God's intention. Maybe you live in a specific particular relationship, which is God's dream for us, and then eventually you get to this place. There have been hints, but something hits, maybe on a Wednesday. Maybe it was 1992 when you realized, I've made it through some bad stuff, but I'm still here. I'm stronger for it. I've accomplished some valuable things. You look in the mirror, most of you have had this, when did I start looking like this? Who's that old person in the mirror? And your hair? You know what the Bible says about gray hair? Crown of glory. That's what the Bible says about gray hair. Uh, well, let me tell you what um, you might already know about older age here. Before the cold winters of life really bear down, there is a window for most of us. So it might be short, it might be decades long, but there is a window for where you have learned enough to know and share a good word about life and you've lived long enough that others will finally listen to you. This is a great little time in there. Uh, it, 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 people are going to sit and notice your presence. They, they want to sit and listen to what secrets, what mysteries do you have? This happens at book club all the time. Book club is uh, me and, and, Dan, and, and uh, Dan and Mary Lou and sometimes Sue churches and then a bunch of old people. <laughs> And they teach us things. All the Hubbards aren't even back there. They, they teach us things all the time through that. It happens at the little table back there in the corner in fellowship. Not, not the first two tables, but Ray's table. Uh, and Betty sits at that table. And there's, there's wisdom gets passed around at that table. And I wish, um, you know, you, you've been through so much at these book club people, the that table people, and I wish this country would do a better job of respecting those elders. Many societies are based on respecting their elders, and maybe it would be a good thing if we stopped and listened to them more. Because um, at least once in a while, they're right, like my grandfather. So, so those of you who are in that place, in that window, what are you going to do with that window? What are you going to do with your wisdom? Uh, it's a hard-earned blessing to be wise and influential. So how are you going to bless other people with the beauty of your years? Well, the Bible has an answer to that. Uh, in Psalms, you, you were aiming for Psalms, Psalm 71, it says, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase, God, I've been paying attention to you since I was young. It's been a long time. I've watched the marvelous things you've done in my life and in the world, and now I'm slowing down. My strength is fading. My hair is gray. Now is the time I need your help to pass on what I know about you. This is what I pray for in my golden years. That's what David said that in the Psalms. This is what I pray for in my golden years is to be able to pass on the wisdom of a long life. And, and, and what do we know about David's life? David was a king and uh, very famous and he didn't do anything right. His whole life was one mistake after another. He'd been through a lot. He'd, he'd had pain thrust upon him. Uh, he had made a lot of mistakes to earn that gray. Uh, he had broke people through romantic relationships and mistakes. He was always so busy at work that one of his sons, at least, said, ah, my dad doesn't care about me, and rebelled. And his busy at work didn't all work that well. In retrospect, he did fine, but through the time, he was in problem after problem. His allies, even his best friend, came and said, you're doing a bad job of this. He wanted to get it right. He wanted to live after God's own heart. That's the phrase that comes through. He wants to live after God's own heart, but it was a tough life, and it took so much time for him to learn humility. Slowly he learned forgiveness and grace because that was the only way through his life. I don't know what it took him so long to learn that God's love does not waver, but eventually he learned that, probably after that estranged son uh, died. He learned that God's love does not waver. In those long years, he learned that it was not about him, it was not about his position, but it, life was about giving to others. And he learned that there were more important things than how you feel at any given moment. He learned how to trust God, even through the worst. And so Psalm 71, he prays, he sings, he says, God, let me share what I've learned about you with the next generation. Which he did, because what Claudia read is David's son. Verse 4, it says, I, once, I was once my father's son. That, Solomon is David's son. He says, I had this grandpa who told me things. I had a mother who tenderly loved me as a child. 
Well, let me tell you, son, this is, what, uh, this is what my father taught me. And so Solomon, remember, he is, some people think of him as the wisest king of all time. He carried all that wisdom from David, but even his life, the stories of him, is about gluttony. It's about greed. And so he had to learn those lessons on his own, as we all end up doing. And somewhere in that process, who knows how old Solomon was, 40, you know, 35, whatever it was, somewhere he wrote down a book of wisdom to his son. And if you listen to... Uh, uh, to, to uh, Claudia. It doesn't say whether the son paid any attention or not. Many sons don't pay attention to those fatherly talks. But the, the, the father said, here's the pains I've suffered. Here's the regrets that I've learned to ignore. Here's the legacies I've worked so hard to often. Do you think the son listened to the hope in his dad's voice? Do you think the son could respect all that Solomon had been through and see the joy that he expressed and, and understood why there are some things he just doesn't talk about that? Do you think the son would ask questions to his father about, uh, follow up questions about what the best life was going to be like or appreciate the faith that held the family together? Could the son believe anything that that wisdom had to, to enter his own unknown future with trust? And if you, could, if you could go back and listen to your own people in your life who tried to tell you those lessons that just went in one ear and out the other, what a blessing that would be for us to go back and hear the things that people who loved us tried to tell us. The Bible speaks so highly of wisdom that sometimes it even takes on a personality. The Greek word for wisdom is Sophia. And so these poets in the Bible, they took the word, and Sophia, and they turned it into the name Sophia. We know people named Sophia. Uh, the poets of the Bible so appreciated wisdom that they turned it into a woman. Some scholars even said that the Hebrews, they really believed that the woman Sophia was there when the Father God was creating the world. That was one of this. this isn't feminism. This is just old ancient Bible stuff. They understood that there was somehow these two relied on each other. That God relied on something feminine and wise. There's even uh, some poets back then who talk about that as a relationship, as though God got married to wisdom, to Sophia. So it held a deep honor for the our faithful ancestors. She is someone to chase after. And the Bible says, "Where are you going to find it? Where are you going to find wisdom? Most often in the souls of old folk." And these ancient people, they spoke so highly of old age and how society and families sh should treat each other, should treat elders. Speak so highly of how they valued their elders that the, very, the Greek word for senior citizen, uh, it carries this necessary connotation of just power and, and wisdom and leadership. The, the word is presbyteros, where we get the name Presbyterian. And so back then, the average person lived to about 45 just seems a short life for us. So anyone then who lived to 60, I mean, that was unique. That was special. We wanted to sit and listen to them. They'd seen a lot. They had status. So on one hand, they appreciated the personal wisdom. On the other hand, Jews and early Christians and all kinds of cultures, they started to realize that relying on kings and rulers and leaders, they're always going to let you down. Always. The best ones are going to have some kind of weakness. So they started to create councils of elders. That was a creation in history. The first time you got some elders, they came together, and they, and they made them kind of lead the place. They knew, they believed that wisdom could be gained in a group more than any individual one person. Eventually, some Christians started to believe that the Holy Spirit is even more likely to inspire us when a group of people who are truly working together gather, like our session, which meets after this church. And so, the, especially the Presbyterian church, but the whole Christian tradition uh, is built on these two foundations. First, the respect of personal wisdom for each person, not just a pope or a bishop or a priest or a saint, but each person. Our elders have something truly sacred. And the other foundation is that it's our collective wisdom that can draw us as a whole toward the kingdom that God expects for us. Personal wisdom, which many of you are soaked in, and collective wisdom that we all rely on together. So what is some of that stuff? That personal wisdom. Um, Tamara's not here. Tamara's doing some sawing or something at the old miners' day. Tamara's a college student. 21 yet? 21? Yeah, 21 yet. Um, she's, kind of, she's breaking into adulthood. The picture of youth, confidence and strength. Her parents have been so intentional about raising Tamara and Katie to be uh, strong. And, and who they are, to know who they are. They're not going to be swayed by friends. They're not going to be swayed by trends. They are young women growing up in the world. And, and if Tamara comes, you know what she does on every Sunday morning? She goes and sings in a choir with a whole bunch of people her grandparents' age. When she comes in this building, you know what she does? 
first thing she does when she walks in that building is go wind that clock that is not moving right now. No one else wound that clock, but Tamara comes in here every time on Sunday morning or whenever it is, and she winds Brownlee's clock. Some of you remember Brownlee. I didn't meet him, but Tamara could easily just trust her engineering degree. She, she could trust her 20-something-year-old friends to define her value. She could trust herself to be strong and the measure of what she makes. She could be independent and break away to her own life. But somehow she was touched by a piece of history, and by, a, by, a, by a man, an elder. And so she goes and winds that clock as though she's sitting and listening to what can be taught to this generation. And here's what God tells us in that psalm, in that psalm is that you too can shape the hearts of this generation. I'm not, not speaking to the young folks right now, but all of the, the oldest folks in our crowd, you can shape the hearts of this generation. You can do it perhaps by uh, volunteering with Nancy back there. Nancy, we're, we're, yeah, this Nancy back here is starting a program to tutor fourth graders at the elementary school. That's passing it on to the next generation. Any retired teachers, come and help her out with that kind of thing. You could pass on your collective wisdom by being any kind of leader in this church, whether it's just uh, being an usher today, which we have a couple elders doing, whether it's being a, a formal leader in the church in some way, you can do that. You can be, uh, pass on the heart of your generation simply by being here a stable pillar. We hear about pillars of the church, and part of that is that every time that Katie comes in, the pews are filled with people that she's seen, that she's grown up with. It doesn't take much effort to sit and be part of this praise and prayer. So if that's some of the personal wisdom, what about the collective wisdom that draws us forward? Well, the Presbyterian Church, run by elders, uh, it's been changing a lot. And it gets accused, changes always get accused, those young people are doing something wild and crazy and they're being thrown around by the winds of culture. But really what the uh, church is doing is our elders are guiding our church through the winds of culture. And our denomination, is it controversial? Yes, it's been controversial lately. Gay marriage and Israel-Palestine, environmental justice, gun control. Some, this church is discovering, not, not this congregation, but the, the national church is discovering some humble, powerful stance on all these kind of issues. And we've learned enough to trust God's sovereignty and providence that we'll make it through those controversies. And we've learned enough about God's diverse kingdom to... Uh, be able to live together and disagree about any of those things. And so we as a church move forward faithfully, prayerfully, responding to God's grace and mercy through all the hard things that we've lived together. We as a church have seen enough pain to know how important it is to be a blessing on the world. And so when you see on the news the Syrian refugee crisis and you say, who can help those? That country should help over there. There needs to be someone who helps those. Well, we've responded in a particular way. This denomination is about 500 years old, 350 years old in America, and we have had mission workers around the world for so long. Specifically, we've been working in Lebanon for decades, uh, building networks, building friendships, so that when people started flooding over the border, our leaders were there, able to bring local leaders together to support the very people that Jesus would have cared about the most, the oppressed, the least of these, the ones running away, the hopeless. And none of us can just, none of us, even all of us if we went, we can't fly over to the Middle East and fix things. But because of the faithful men and women that have brought up this church to this point, we have those connections to be able to help. So next week, there's a special offering. Many Presbyterian churches are taking the peacemaking offering. We do that in this church every year. It's a special Sunday where we look at world communion and how we're connected to all these, I guess it's two Sundays away, all these different, uh, different faith systems and people. And in two weeks when we take that offering, 75% will go specifically to the Presbyterian mission workers in Lebanon who are working with the Syrian refugees to find them a stable place to live in this, in this chaos. Uh, 25% of it will stick to building peace around this neighborhood, which definitely needs that. There are other ways to help the Syrian crisis. Many of you, I'm sure, have done things, but by connecting it to a long church, we stand on the backs of these people who have come before us, and we build future relationships so that when the next crisis comes, we're that much stronger to be able to respond. And that's the thing about our collective wisdom. More than any one person, collective wisdom lasts. It inspires us now because it has and will inspire us toward a peaceable kingdom. So wherever we are on our, on our journey from uh, 
The guy who sang, played guitar last week, he has a one-month-old baby. If uh, We had did a baptism a couple weeks ago with a six-month-old baby, something like that. Um, from that birth and place of discovering the purpose of your life to the lessons of finding your, your, your place in the world as you make all these mistakes, from relationships and how we live out God's hope for ourselves all the way to the golden years where it's our job to pass on our wisdom. In all those places, the whole holy life is one that is infused with the Spirit. The whole holy life is one that we can reach for every day and every moment. May we find some wisdom and love in that.